my name's Luke and I've been coming here a few weeks. You might have realized I'm like weirdly just show up and I start like interjecting myself into some of your conversations. So um, I'm just trying to be young again, okay? I just turned 32 a few months ago and so I'm starting to feel it. You know, knees are starting to hurt and so hanging around all of you kind of helps that. No, not really, uh, but um, do enjoy it. And I've uh, been trying to get more plugged into the church a little more. And uh, just to confess, I'm actually a little nervous, okay? So I do fly around the country. I was just in Georgia last night, and I speak to professionals, CEOs, million, billion dollar companies, and I don't get nervous at all, okay? I'm a little nervous tonight. There's a couple reasons for that. One is because uh, I've had a couple, you know, presentations to high schoolers and youth, and uh, you're a tough crowd, all right? So uh, I want to impress all of you, but I also know uh, this is God's word, okay? So when I work, um, I don't have my Bible out, like it's in my heart, right? But I'm talking about other things. God's word's really serious. Like God's glory, his honor is really important. And uh, he believes that, and I think we should believe that too. And so the passage we're going to look at tonight is actually going to help us get a little bit of a glimpse of that, okay? And what that might look like and what that could mean for us as youth and adults and wherever you're at, okay? So uh, before we get into the passage... Uh, I'll explain the title in a minute, but before we get into the passage, I want to preface things a little bit. So this is in 2 Kings, all right? Context with 2 Kings, all right? So all of you, I think you're in what? Is it Genesis or something? Abraham, right? Okay, so that's like kind of the beginnings of all this stuff. This is pretty far along after that, uh, in kind of sort of deep into the Old Testament. What's going on right now, and I'm not going to give too much because I'm not a biblical scholar, okay? So like Robert, I don't want to say something and be like, that's wrong, right? But I'll just give you like what I know generally, okay? So Israel's messy, okay? God's people, they're in a lot of stuff. Um, they wanted to have kings kind of like the people that were around them that were not following God. Rather than just being okay with God, they wanted kings. They wanted kings like everybody else to kind of be like them. And so, you know, what ended up happening, God eventually, after you know, some reluctance, gave them what they were asking for, gave them kings, humanly, you know, man, fleshly kings to lead them uh, in their lives and lead their kingdoms, right? But what ended up happening is those kings just were full of disobedience. Now, not, not all of them, but really in First and Second Kings, especially in Second Kings, it was super ugly, okay? Uh, super disobedient, all right? So uh, really in these times, the only real place where we saw a lot of God showing up or like his character really being evident was through the prophets, okay? So in 2 Kings, in the part that we're in, some of you may have heard the name Elijah before, okay? He's a prophet. It's pretty common. A lot of people name their kids Eli, you know, stuff like that. So that's really what it comes from. Uh, and I want to tell you about him, but before I tell you about him, really the focus of our story is on Elisha, okay? The way you say it, I think is actually Elisha. I'm not going to say that because it, it just sounds weird to me. So I'm going to say Elisha, because most of us, I think, know that. Uh, who's he? So he's a prophet. All right. Now, let me tell you a little bit about prophets, like what was their thing? What was a prophet? Prophet was a messenger of God in the Old Testament. OK, uh, so when there were kings doing all this stuff that they weren't supposed to do or, you know, whatever, the prophet was there to be God's messenger and really represent God's voice. OK, now, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do, Okay, any of us gotten in trouble, I have plenty of times and dad's got to show up, you know, back in the day when I lived at home, all right? I didn't really like when I got caught in the middle of my bad stuff, okay? So it was not as fun to have dad show up. Well, that's kind of what it felt like with the prophets, but to an extreme, okay? So as a result, prophets were unpopular. In fact, they were hated, they were despised, they were tortured, they were chased, they were attacked, you know, soldiers, kings, all this stuff. They were often... Uh, even Elijah was on the run fearing for his life because he was delivering a message from God, being obedient, but it was really hard and the people didn't like the message and they wanted to kill him for it. That's just like basically what was going on. Okay. So uh, to give you that sense of an idea, Elijah in particular, not Elisha, this is Elijah, was kind of the major like prophet in that time that has, a, he, he was really famous. And I, I think what really made him famous was because he was trying to be a prophet for Israel in one of the most messiest times. I mean, I'm talking like they would worship other gods. They do everything backwards, in, in, including something really messed up. They would sacrifice babies. 
And I'm talking like thousands of them, okay? So there's actually uh, archaeological evidence of infant bones anywhere from like one to three to six months old, like thousands of them, uh, ceremonial sites that they found where they were just burning babies to these false gods. So like I'm, I'm talking really wicked, dark, evil stuff, right? And here's Elijah having to walk in there when this is the culture, the norm, the powers that be, all that stuff. And he's got to walk in there and wade into that and say, this isn't good. You're doing it wrong. You know, you got to change your ways. And even uh, being the, the messenger for God's punishment, which was often a lot of these false prophets being killed, slaughtered, burned. I mean, it, it was just really ugly stuff. Okay, so if you, you're interested in a, a snow day and you want to entertain yourself, read some of the Old Testament. It'll be... It'll be interesting, okay? But that was kind of the reality back then. So knowing that, um, let's go ahead and read the passage. So did my copy go away? All right, I'm going to read it from here. Here we go. Robert, could you run me up a copy of the paper in a second? I think. All right, thanks, man. All right, here we go. So here's the passage. So we have Elisha, okay? Who's Elisha? Elisha was Elijah's kind of like his student, Okay, and it was really the person uh, who filled Elijah's shoes. So right at the end of First Kings, if some of you have heard of this before, and even beginning of Second Kings, Elijah gets taken up in a whirlwind. So God takes him. Okay, he takes him. He's like one of the couple people that we know of that never actually like physically died on the earth. He was like just taken straight up into heaven. Okay, I don't know why. I don't know why God did that. I'm, I'm not going to try to explain it. But basically, what happened is Elijah found Elisha brought him under his wing, showed him all this stuff, lived some, a little bit of life together, and then they're walking together, just those two, and Elijah's like, I'm going to be leaving. And Elisha's like, I don't really want you to leave. You know, I'm going to stick around as much as I can. And in the middle of their conversation, he gets whipped up into the air by a bunch of fiery chariots and like tornado whirlwind stuff. I mean, it's just wild, right? And uh, leaves his cloak. So his cloak falls off. Okay, Elisha picks it up after tearing his clothes to pieces. So he, he's grieving, he's sad, he's low. I, I mean, what happened to Elijah? I mean, if I could leave the earth without dying, that'd be kind of cool, you know? <laughs> like, you just get whipped up there, you don't have to worry about cancer or whatever, or getting in a car accident or growing old, you know? Kind of cool, right? Uh, but for the people on earth, that can still be sad, okay? So Elisha, when he went up, was saying, my father, my father. So basically his, his father figure, he left his family to follow Elijah just got whipped up in the air, and now he feels like he's by himself, right? Sad, missing, all that stuff. Um, three days go by. All these people are trying to look for Elijah in the mountains because they're like, maybe, like they literally say, maybe God dropped him off on a hill somewhere, and we got to go find him so he's not stuck, right? Uh, so they're going and looking for him and uh, can't find him, even though Elisha's like, no, he's gone. Like, you're not going to find him, but they went and looked anyway, you know? Um, so then after that, right, so imagine where he is. It's like three, to, three, four days maybe after all this happens, sad, alone, grieving. I mean, God's with him, right? But he's, he's still human, and he's on a walk, and this is what happens. Okay, here we go. Uh, so Elisha, uh, verse 23, went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, uh, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. What? <laughs> from there, he went to Mount Carmel, and from there, he returned to Samaria. So I just got to pause. I kind of love, even though it's weird and kind of messed up, the Bible sometimes just like drops something and then just like, and then he went on his way. You know, like what? Bears just came out and mauled some kids. And like, and then we're just going to move on. So why did I pick this passage? Well, first off, I, you know, Robert asked me that he's shaking his head. I'm like, I'm just going to pick the most wildest passage to talk to you about leadership, right? Because I think there's a lot in here. And I also want to fire, like uh, spark your fire to get into the Bible. Because I found this text because I was just bored. And I'm like, I've never like, I, I say I'm a Christian. You know, I, I, I live this thing, but I, I've never read like probably 75, 80% of the stuff in here. I got no idea what's in here. And so I just sat down and started reading through the Old Testament, and it's wild, okay? And this is one of the wild things. And I was like, i got to share it with all of you so you know it, okay? But going back to this, what the heck is going on? Like, your reaction, right, is like, God, like, you're just, bears are just ripping up kids for calling someone a name? I mean, I, I mean that seems really mean. That seems unjust. 
You know, if you look at other, so King James, has anybody got King James in here? Okay, like thou art, all that stuff. That translation is like small children. Like it's like, like young, young little boys, right? So like, what's going on here? And uh, it's hard to answer all this stuff, but I think there's actually a lot of clarity here that I want to look, uh, look at this with you, okay? But we got to break this down. So how this works, Bethel, what was Bethel? So we can understand what's going on there. Bethel was one of the two main worship centers for northern Israel, which was kind of what was going on at that time. Okay, so this is kind of the place he's walking past. Um, and uh, with that, uh, it was a super pagan city. Super pagan. Okay, so like you're talking all this wickedness that I'm talking about, you know, baby sacrifices, all this stuff. This was like one of the hot spots for it. All right. So just to give you like a sense of that sort of area. Okay. They worshipped uh, Baal, which, you know, we've heard that name before. Other gods. Uh, reversed their, um, all the like creeds and all the festivals and the things that God told his people to do, to remember, you know, when they left Egypt and all these sorts of things, they're, they're basically like, we're just doing backwards everything. Okay. So if you can get the sense for this, a super wicked place. And I'm talking like way more wicked than like someone calling you name at school. I mean, this is really ugly stuff. Okay. So that's the idea of this place. Now, Let's break down uh, the young boys or these kind of, you know, children, as a lot of the texts call it. This is where it can get challenging because um, if you don't realize it, we're taking a translated version of the original text, like translated probably one or two times or three times over. Right. So copied over time. So what really helps us is to look at the original words that this was written in and help define it. OK, so I'm just going to read off my notes here. Uh, for young boys, the actual Hebrew of this is the words, uh, a noun, na'ar, and the adjective gatan, okay? Or katan, kind of like the awesome game. Anybody? Katan, okay? There you go, yes, yes. Uh, so, na'ar, katan. Um, where was this used? So, na'ar is translated as boys, youth, but it can also mean a lot of different things. Servant, armor bearer, or even priest. So, that's kind of interesting, okay? Not just like little babies. Um, Katan means youth, but exactly how young, we don't always know. But we can get a sense from looking at other areas in the Bible of what these terms could mean, okay? So uh, just to give you an idea, this Na'ar Katan is used from anything from actually describing baby Moses, which would be really messed up, all right, if we had a bunch of babies out there with the bears, uh, to fully grown men in the Bible, all right? So really wide range. So that means we have to look a little deeper at, you know, what's going on around this, okay? Uh, the least probable is actually that they were any younger than all of you, all right? Because when we look at this, most likely what's happening when they're coming out of the city of um, Bethel and they're coming out to mock the prophet of God, also based on the use of this and the adjectives, is, I did a lot of research on this, but it's hard for me to kind of wrap it up. The idea here or the the prevailing belief is that these were probably high school to college age men. Okay. So old enough to do some damage and know what's right or wrong. I mean, I'm sure all of you, you know, when you're misbehaving, right? Okay. My sons are like seven, four, and three. And my three-year-old sure as heck knows when he's not doing what he's supposed to. Okay. So, you know, imagine your age, right? And you can also do some damage, especially if you're in a pack of people, like all oh, you get mad at me, you come here because I'm talking about bears and stuff and you want to fight me. I'm going to lose. All right. So uh, especially if I don't have any hair like some of us in the room. So you, you know what I'm saying? Like it's just playing, bro. Um, so it's one of these things that we just have to keep that in mind rather than just read this at face value and say, oh, this is horrible. It's a bunch of kids, mall and bears, you know, all that stuff. OK, so keeping that in mind, um, <clears throat> these people, especially in Bethel, were also sick of the prophets of God, like Elijah hated them. Okay. So now when they find out that Elisha is the new head dude, you know, that's going to be delivering all these tough messages, they don't want him around. If you look at the text in first Kings, which is the book right before this, when Elijah was around, one of the instances that happened is all these prophets, not these particular ones, obviously, because they're still alive, but a bunch of them were misleading God's people. And so there was this crazy judgment thing. There was fire that came down from heaven and consumed them. And, but basically, Elijah was the guy that was there saying, you're all wrong. This is evil. We got to do something different here. Okay. And so they don't like him. They don't like when Elisha shows up because they feel threatened by him. 
because their way of life, their power, all these sorts of things are at risk when God's judgment shows up in, in his voice. OK, so keeping that in mind, uh, what did they say to him? OK, so their words go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. OK, so bald head's pretty straightforward. OK, uh, it means he didn't really have any hair. They're just insulting him, mocking him. Right. Uh, but the bald head thing or sorry, but the go up thing is a little interesting. So when you look at the translations of this, what they're effectively saying is blast off, get out of here, you know, basically go up. And what's interesting is there, that's how uh, his master presumably died. So I know he didn't technically die on the earth, but for all intents and purposes to someone who's secular, the guy's no longer on the earth anymore. He's out of here. So they see that he died, right? Like Elijah's gone. He's not here, right? So they're effectively going up to this prophet, Elisha, in a large pack of them, could do some damage in saying, get out of here. Uh, we don't want you here. In fact, go die, basically. Go up just the way your master did, like die like he did. OK, so that kind of shifts things a little bit. Right. Um, why did I call it Goldilocks and the she bears? Well, anybody. So does anybody in the room not know Goldilocks and the three bears? I just want to check how old I am here. Anybody? Okay, I heard some groans, so that's the pun, all right? Goldie lie in the th uh, she bears, all right? Because it's called she bears, all right? But when you do this, when you look at this, um, they're basically telling him they want him dead, and they're mocking him, completely mocking him, okay? So now that we understand that, I want to look into Elisha's response, okay? So Elisha's response, the text basically says that he cursed them, okay? So he cursed them. Now, by our definition, uh, what does cursing mean? Well, cursing is like saying some bad things, right? Like you say the bad word, drop some bombs, you know what I'm saying? Uh, right? So that's kind of cursing. We got to look at what that actually means. So biblically, what does cursing mean? Okay, cursing, uh, it's, I think, helpful to understand what the opposite. So, if, you know, to figure out cursing, well, what's the opposite? Opposite of curse is actually to bless. All right, now to bless, what that means biblically is to acknowledge or um, give the presence of God or like God's presence there, acknowledge it, right? Like I can't really, you know, command God's presence to be somewhere, but I can pray for someone to be blessed. And that's kind of what that means right now. It's taken a lot of different directions with culture. When we sneeze, we say, bless you. It's like, what, you know, I'm not sending God into your nose because you, you know, you're sick, right? I think that's, that's weird, but, but, but that's really where we're kind of the core of that comes from. Okay. So to curse would be to remove God's blessing or his grace or his mercy or his, you know, all those things that we actually get all the time. OK, uh, another thing that can maybe help us understand this, there's a passage and I, I think uh, the Gospel of John, but it shows up in uh, almost all the go Gospels and it's Jesus cursing a fig tree. Now, this is kind of funny because um, what he does, he is walking along and it says he's he's really hungry. It says he's really hungry. And off in the distance, he sees a fig tree that's in leaf. So he's like, oh, cool. Like there's probably some food over there on that fig tree, right? And I guess he knew his leaves. So that's cool. You know, Jesus was into, the, into nature. So he, so he walks over to the fig tree and there's no fruit on it anywhere. And he gets mad and he curses it and it withers to absolutely nothing. So what's interesting there is uh, Jesus was sinless. So when he did that, like... He wasn't sinning. So I thought that was interesting because I've heard people look at this text with Elisha and they say, well, he was misusing God's power. And I'm like, I don't know about that. Because in the times that prophets or kings or things in this time misused God's power or, you know, their authority that God gave them, there were major consequences. And I don't see any of that in here. OK. Um, also, I want to clarify uh, Elisha is not animal control. He's not a bear whisperer. Okay. I just want to clarify that. So uh, he didn't actually sick the bears on the kids. And I can prove that to you, at least my belief of that, because earlier in this, uh, in this story, okay, Elijah was uh, fearing his life and he was running from man, from the king at the time who was trying to kill him. And he hid out in a little river because he just delivered some really bad, nasty news. And there was going to be a drought. And God said through an angel that he was going to feed him through ravens and bring him bread. OK, now what that means in the context of this is if prophets could control animals, I mean, send me a pizza, raven. You know what I'm saying? Like they don't got to wait for God to send them bread. 
And if, if I'm scared, man, I'm just gonna find a bunch of lions and bears and like, I'm gonna do some damage. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm gonna get me a pack and I'm gonna deliver the message to God. And if you disagree, well, here's the bears. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna have a problem with it. You know what I'm saying? So that's not the way the prophets were. They, they were, I mean, they didn't have to be afraid because God was with them, but again, they're human, right? So that was like their natural reaction. It's not like they could call in an army of animals to come and defend them, right? So, so I believe this was God's judgment on the false prophets, which we see a lot. I believe this was God's judgment on them for their actions. And that really opens my mind up to the reality of sin. It's serious, okay? In the Bible, you know, especially when Jesus comes around, uh, there's a lot of grace. There's a lot of mercy. Like you don't see bears coming in and just tearing up the Pharisees. And, you know, like nowadays, you know, it's, it's not like someone does something really bad. And then, you know, like that's not, that's not what it's really like anymore. I don't think now are there consequences of sin? Yes, of course. But it's not like I got bears coming out of the woods when I, you know, get angry at my wife and then, you know, that's it, right? Like that's, that's not the way it works. Okay. Elisha didn't take matters into his own hands. Now, was he in a low spot? Was he having trouble? Yeah, of course, right? But I don't think he was misusing authority that God had given him in this moment, okay? Uh, with that said, you know, I want you to remember this and really put the focus on God. Remember uh, in this who prophets were at the time. Prophets were God's messengers, okay? Uh, they were not God. So in this moment, when you want to boil it all down, what's really happening here is you have a battle between evil and good. You got God in his presence and his voice through the prophet, and you have evil through the false prophets. Now, what I find interesting in here when we read this passage is we can make it about Elisha, but it's not. We can make it about Elisha in this passage, but it's really not. It's about God and his honor and his name, because that's who Elisha represents right? That's why the bears came out of the woods. And when I said earlier that I'm nervous about delivering the message to you tonight, because I don't do this very often, it's because God's, God's holy and he, he's real and he's powerful and he deserves it. He deserves our worship, right? And so when we handle things like this, there needs to be a level of reverence and fear, not fear of man, fear of God. And not that we need to be afraid of him in the sense that we're not going to come to him. You know, he's full of grace and mercy. Yes, he's also powerful and he hates sin. He loves us. He hates sin, right? So that's really what I think the core of this is. All right. Now I want to go to the cross references to really bring this home so we can get you to some discussions here before I talk your ears off. Okay. I'll go all night. So here's the cross references. First passage, whoever says to the wicked, you are in the right will be cursed by peoples abhorred by nations, but those who rebuke the wicked will have delight and a good blessing will come upon them. That's from Proverbs, right? So here we have, um, you know, it plain and simple. If you're going to sit there and approve of wickedness or sin, it's not going to go well, right? If you go against that and you stand up for what's right and what's truth through God's calls, right? In obedience, there's a lot of blessing in that, okay? Let's keep going. Next one, turn away from evil and do good. So shall you dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. What a beautiful promise. God will not forsake his saints. Saints meaning like his children, right? Part of his family. You're God's child. He will not forsake you. That's a promise you can stand on. And when Elisha, or maybe you put yourself in his shoes in a time that you felt threatened, or you felt on the receiving end of things, you can know that God is with you in that, right? And he will not forsake you. Let's keep going. Next one, beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I'm just going to confess to you, there are plenty of times in my adult life uh, that I've wanted some, thought some pretty mean things about people that have done some mean things to me or people that I love or my kids, right? Uh, I'm just going to be honest, okay? Like I want to punch somebody sometimes, you know? I'm like, I don't really want you around anymore. You're a horrible person, you know, these sorts of things, okay? That's just my flesh. Okay. Um, the Bible tells us not to take those matters into our own hands. We don't take revenge. We don't lash out. Okay. We trust God with that. He's the judge. He will bring justice, right? Uh, like he did with this situation. Uh, but ultimately that's not ours to take. What are we called to do? 
And when you look at this, the next one, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And I think that one rolls really well into the next verse as well. If the world hates you, know that it hated me. And this is Jesus saying this, right? If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, if that's the case for you, therefore the world hates you. Okay? If you're not of the world, the world's going to hate you. All right? If you're in the world, it's probably going to be all right. You're not going to have that much problems probably or that much of that hatred that we're talking about. Okay? Or that adversity. Um, what I find in this, in a world that constantly tells us it's about you, it's your story, it's your life, it's your career, it's your job, it's, you know, what do you want, new year, new you, social media, all this stuff, there's a focus on yourself. And I find personally for me, especially when I was in your shoes and I was thinking about school, career, friends, uh, I was very successful in my athletics. Honestly, it was an idol for me, okay? I was on that track because our football team absolutely sucked, okay? So I was like, not gonna waste my time there. I was on that track for hours every single day, and then I'd go to the gym and I'd work out. And that's just all I did because that was my kingdom, and that's what I cared about, and that's what I wanted was just to be the best, fastest person ever. And I remember getting on my knees when I would be running and sprinting, you know, out at night and during the day at my school, and I'd be like, God, make me faster. God, help me, you know, make me stronger. And, okay, that's not necessarily wrong, but my heart in it was to build up myself because I was putting myself in the middle of God's story rather than making it about him right? So I used, I say this back in that, in that time of my life, I'd say Jesus was always my savior. Okay. I believed in him, right? He was my God. Like I, I went to church and went to youth group, just like all of you. He was not always my Lord, meaning someone that I served and looked to for direction and asked him, what would you have for me? Rather than saying, this is my plan and I want to do it. And you're going to help me God get it done. Right. And so what I want to encourage you with tonight is to think about <clears throat> where you can start submitting more of your life to God, okay? And also realize the world is going to want you to do the complete opposite, okay? And in fact, sometimes when you make those decisions, they are not going to be easy, and you might even be scared, okay? When I look back on when I was in public school, because I grew up in public school, okay? Um, I'm actually homeschooling my kids, because I'm like, nope, not going to go there, right? <laughs> like... It's a battlefield out there and it's getting worse, okay? And I think all of you growing up where you're at need to be even more suited up. Christianity isn't cool anymore. It might be cool here tonight when we're all together, but from a broad sense in the culture of the United States, it's not, it's not cool anymore. And so you're gonna do this thing, it's gonna take some sacrifice and it's gonna take some challenge. But I wanna tell you in that you don't have to be afraid. Now, worldly, I can't make you any promises there, but from an eternal perspective with, with what really matters, what really matters, you don't have to fear because God has already won. When Jesus died on that cross, rose again and defeated death, there is absolutely nothing that can hold you back from being victorious if you're on God's side. And I'm not saying in your plan, I'm talking about God's plan for your life, right? There's a big difference there, but it can be easy to get them mixed up, okay? So for the last passage here, I want you to think about this, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. That's our call is to love others, right? Love others, leave the justice and the vengeance and our frustration when we feel wrong. That's often the time when God can be most glorified, but it's also, trust me, the most difficult and I'm not perfect at it. Okay, let me check the time. I think we're good. Okay, so we got some discussion questions here. I'm going to pray before we, before we break up. Uh, but the idea here is I want you to start thinking in your life where you can start recognizing maybe some ways that you've compromised. Are there some ways right now in your school, maybe at home, where you can start shifting, where you can start shifting your posture to honor God more than maybe yourself or maybe even someone else like a man or someone. Now that doesn't mean your parents, like that's, that's not what I'm talking about because the Bible also says to, you know, submit to them, right? But I'm talking about trying to please man versus please God, okay? So uh, let me pray and then we'll, we'll divide up and um, 
hear from you later, okay? All right, let's bow our heads. God, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you for your truth, and I want to thank you for your victory. You've won the battle, the biggest battle ever, and you invite us to take part in that, which is so cool. That is so amazing, God. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you that it's not about us, because if it was on our shoulders, the weight of that, I don't think we could handle it, God, but you can. And so tonight, I pray that all of us submit to you, trust in you, um, and... Uh, just discern in our hearts where we can trust in you more and uh, honor your name and, and worship you, God, because you deserve it. In your holy name, amen.